Thank you very much, uh, Franz, for the very nice uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again and so many uh, friends uh, I'm seeing in the, in the chat. Thanks. I would like to thank also Chiara Righi. Let me take the opportunity, in fact, to thank also Roberta Zanin and Ulysses Barres de Almeida for the kind invitation. And my collaborators, Covino and uh, Stefano Covino and Pietro Schipani, in this uh, particular uh, enterprise uh, for their uh, uh, collaboration and support. So um, I will uh, start uh, essentially from uh, the basic uh, light polarization. Uh, we know we learn very early in our uh, curriculum, in our uh, training, scientific training, that light is uh, uh, composed by um, um, has an electric and magnetic uh, field component that oscillate perpendicularly to the, the direction of propagation. If uh, some uh, polarizing element, obstacle, scattering surface, whatever, is interposed in the path, the, this element may select one of these oscillating oscillation planes and polarize the light on that plane, create polarized light on that plane. You can have this polarization uh, essentially is therefore can be considered as a, a, a breaking of symmetry produced in a, in a radiative source, we will see later, especially by magnetic field, or by uh, intrinsically, locally, or by something, some obstacle, something interposed, uh, intervening between the observer source and the observer. You see various examples here of electron scattering, dust scattering and absorption, or surface scattering, all having the same result, the sa same final outcome of creating a preferential direction for the polarization, for the uh, propagation, uh, plane of propagation of light. We know that astrophysical sources show polarization, in fact, at many wavelengths, from radio to uh, gamma rays, in fact. Uh, we are uh, uh, uncovering with time, there, there are uh, uh, spectacular uh, recent results of X-ray, very significant X-ray uh, polarimetry that I will uh, touch on, I will show something. And uh, this is caused, these uh, uh, essentially, this, uh, polar, these signals, polarized signals uh, are uh, related to intrinsic geometry of the source, a preferential geometric direction, like a symmetry uh, axis, scatter uh, radiation, as we were uh, seeing before in the previous slide, and again, scattering of radiation by magnetic fields. So also magnetic fields can be considered a scattering element with their preferred direction. They force uh, particles, leptons, or even protons, to uh, gyrate and they create uh, naturally a uh, um, direction or plane of propagation for the uh, light that will therefore appear as uh, polarized. So uh, here are some, we will focus on a particular class of targets of polarized sources during this talk, which, which uh, uh, are the transients are of interest for the Cherenkov telescope array, of course. So transients that uh, um, are emitting in gamma rays and uh, particularly in very high energy gamma rays. However, I, so I will show just with this slide how ubiquitous and heterogeneous uh, polarization can be and how much information we can derive from polarized light um, in addition complementary and added to the total light of a variety of sources. You can see here, for example, on the top left, you see a, a protoplanetary disk around a rather famous bright star, AB Aurigue, as seen by the sphere instrument at uh, the VLT. And the inner, the central twists are thought that are seen in polarized light are thought to be related to a newly born planet around this star. Uh, below, you can see a spectacular optical and infrared image, again taken at the VLT. The infrared is with a simple uh, mode at, uh, with sphere. 
and the infrared is from adaptive optics, um, which shows a binary uh, system, a binary, uh, the, a, a butterfly shape of a nebula, of a planetary nebula that whose shape uh, is produced, is caused by the presence of a companion. That is, and this is uncovered, can be can be seen because we have because we have these observations in polarized uh, light. The bottom right shows uh, um, one of the most uh, uh, queer object, uh, objects in the uh, planetary uh, environment. This is a very peculiar, very uh, rare type of comet. It's a recent one, and uh, it's been observed in polarized light, again with force. And its high level of polarization indicates uh, that it's a rather pristine object, namely it has not interacted too much with any uh, with the with the ambient medium with any star and uh, it's the uh, second uh, object ever coming close to our sun from uh, from the uh, external uh, outer uh, solar system um, the the um, more closer to the interest of transients of high energy relativistic sources is polarization in supernovae, which is also a relatively young, relatively recent type of detection. Uh, type 1a supernovae are not expected to be uh, high energy sources, gamma ray sources, but they do uh, exhibit the thermonuclear uh, uh, explosions. So thermonuclear burning, complete thermonuclear burning of a white dwarf by accretion of, uh, after accretion of uh, ma material from a companion. Occasionally, the, um, they have in their photospheres, they exhibit uh, many absorption lines. Occasionally, these areas, these absorption line areas are exhibit some low level of polarization, which indicates uh, not that much asymmetry in the explosion, which, is, which would be more related to polarization in the continuum. Polarization in the line indicates that there is a very irregular clumpy medium in the outer, that, that the uh, outer ejecta are interacting with. And uh, this, so this, these observations, or these uh, polarization uh, observations in the area, in the, in the wavelength ranges of absorption lines of 1A supernovae, uh, bear a lot of information on the medium around surrounding the explosion. So let's go more into our uh, in a in a in a more in a zone of comfort, which is the CTA targets, the CTA sky, the TV sky. This uh, uh, view graph shows a map, a TV, the TV map uh, of sources as we we uh, we know it today. Um, it's a relatively uh, low number of sources compared to other uh, wavelength ranges. There are so far only 200, less than 300 TV sources detected, uh, about one fourth and one quarter of which are not identified. The, those that, that have been identified, you see them here uh, uh, color coded. In fact, you see, here you see you see uh, more or less everything. The, the um, different colors indicate different sources. The majority of the galactic ones are obviously concentrated on the plane. The, uh, the rest, the extragalactic ones are uh, predominantly blazers. So active galactic nuclei, radio loud active galactic nuclei with uh, uh, very powerful relativistic jets pointing close to the observer direction, as we will see in a moment. And a few of them, a handful, in fact, of these red extragalactic sources are gamma ray bursts. TV detection of gamma ray bursts is recent. There are like, as I say, a handful, and I have only highlighted the most famous one, the GRV of 9 October last year, the brightest of all times, because it's so powerful. And since it is located a relatively low redshift for a gamma ray burst, uh, it was seen, uh, it, it was detected as a very extremely bright source at all wavelengths. 
And we will see something about this guy uh, later on. So um, these TV sources, so particularly the extra galactic ones, are um, char all characterized by, the, by a common uh, property. Their spectra are dominated by non-thermal processes, namely synchrotron radiation and the, the higher energies, occasionally inverse Compton scattering of, um, of relativistic particles of photons in which are either intrinsic photons, namely synchrotron photons themselves, synchrotron self-compton, or external photons in the medium, external photons, fields of photons that are in the area, like emission line photons, accretion disk photons, even um, external photons. In some uh, cases, uh, we have, we do see in blazers also this type of scattering, but the common uh, uh, trait, the common feature is non-thermal radiation, which we know can be intrinsically very highly polarized. The, 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 as we know from our studies, uh, the Ribicki Lightman uh, radiative processes textbook tells us and demonstrates that synchrotron radiation can be as high as 75%. So um, it is very difficult, very hard to see, to observe this high level of uh, uh, polarization. But we will see with blazers, we get very close to it. And uh, so let's start from the, uh, from these, the most famous uh, non-thermal source in the extragalactic sky, the most famous jet in the sky. The sky of the radio jet of M M87, which has actually been detected at all wavelengths. M87, in fact, is also a TV source, not, which is not seen as structured in TV as it, uh, the, the, the lower energies, but of course makes it extremely uh, interesting. So you see here a uh, um, uh, very you know, the, the the jet of the source uh, observed at various wavelengths and various scales, starting from the HST observations in uh, the in optical. The length of this uh, uh, the optical jet is about ten arc seconds, so HST is particularly suited to map the the knots the bright knots along this jet. Then there is a zoom in with ALMA. This is polarized light. This is uh, radio polarization with ALMA that shows an extremely interesting and complex distribution of uh, linear polarization along the jet. Then again, uh, the VLBA that zooms in uh, on, the, on the core of the ALMA uh, image. And finally, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, the very famous Event Horizon Telescope, uh, the, the millimetric uh, uh, image of the uh, area, of the close circumnuclear uh, area of the, uh, of the object, of the core. And you see, this, this is a polarized image. So if you, if you observe, if you look at this uh, image, this final DHD uh, image, you will see there are very thin uh, curves that represent the reconstructed polarization, uh, polarized uh, lines. And so the analysis of these lines, these lines vary with time. There is a time variable uh, millimetric, uh, the, the detection, the millimetric detection of polarization is a time variable. There, is, there are variations between these uh, observations. Um, they globally show a quite high level of polarization of 15%, which is, however, not uniform. It's not overall. It's uh, concentrated in the southwest uh, uh, area of the source. And the, um, the application of uh, uh, magnetohydrodynamics uh, codes uh, with relativistic uh, uh, corrections, relativistic assumptions, uh, based on the in total intensity and uh, polarized uh, linear polarization maps could be used, could, could be applied to reconstruct some physical parameters very close to the, to the black hole. So a Gauss, a, a magnetic field of a few, between few and 30 Gauss, 
and an accretion rate of 10 to the minus four solar masses per year. These uh, uh, radio jets, as we know, uh, are, are ubiquitous, are very common in, uh, in the sky. Uh, they are detected as radio galaxies, not uh, most of which are much farther than, uh, than M87. And uh, they, the, when they, we see them, we see the two jets uh, quite uh, clearly and superluminal motions, uh, as we will see in a moment. They have a, a variety of uh, spectacular manifestations in uh, uh, spatial manifestations in the, the radio wavelengths. Um, occasionally, these jets point to very small angles, like five, three degrees, with respect to the uh, line of view, to the observer uh, uh, angle. So therefore, we don't see them as radio galaxies, and we see them as blazers, as we call them, uh, which are simply radio galaxies with huge aberration, special relativity aberration effects, because this plasma that moves along these two is collimated and moves at relativistic speeds along um, these the, 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 the jet directions and form kiloparsec uh, jets are compressed spatially, the, the, spatially in, uh, in, on the sky. We see a projection of these jets on the sky, a very tiny projection. And most often we don't see, we just see them as radio compact cores. We don't see the, 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 the jet at all, but we see all of the relativistic effects like time, time scales for shortening, uh, blue shift of the spectrum, and of course, magnification of the light, of the luminosities, and strong polarization, especially linear polarization. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, as explained in this uh, uh, milestone historical review of Angel and Stockman, Polar strong polarization is the defining characteristic of blazers. Blazers are those uh, sources, uh, radio sources, uh, lineless, optically featureless, or with lines, quasars, with extremely strong radio cores, plus radio spectra, and very strong polarization. And uh, we know uh, a bit more of, of these sources these days. Uh, uh, this is an old uh, view graph that shows the second Fermilat catalog. So the fraction of uh, sources uh, that are bright in MEVG uh, energies. So it's not very up to date because we are now at the fourth catalog, but the gist is the same. The, the, content of a fourth catalog image would be the same, namely the majority, the vast majority of these sources, of these LAT sources are indeed blazers. And in fact, identification, uh, painstaking identification work of unidentified LAT sources uh, is leading, is systematically leading as expected to the result that also a large, the vast majority, a large fraction of the unidentified Fermilat sources are blazers themselves. So the, the sample of gamma ray blazers or MEVG blazers is just increasing. They are the dominant uh, source of gamma rays of MEV to TV uh, rays in the extragalactic uh, sky. So let's see a little bit uh, about their uh, polarization. Uh, these are just uh, two examples of uh, polarized uh, light, polarization of two very famous uh, blazers. 3C279 is one of the brightest and most uh, uh, intensively, uh, intensely variable. Uh, it has been, it is a TV source, uh, despite the, the relatively high redshift, although many, uh, many extragalactic TV sources have been recently detected um, at redshifts even larger than this one, 0.54. And uh, it shows large optical variability, you see here in the, on the top left, and the linear uh, 
polarization per percentage in the bottom uh, uh, together with the radio polarization. And you can appreciate here the good correlation between optical and radio polarization, although the optical varies much more with much larger amplitude, which reflects a variability property of blazers. Variability amplitude in blazers is frequency dependent, is larger at larger energies. And it can reach 3C279 is one of the, of the most polarized. You can see it here. It reaches polarization linear percentages of 40%, which is, uh, uh, which is not of every, of every, not every blazer is polarized to this level, but very frequently um, they do in, in high polarized states, they often reach this value. Um, on the right, you see, um, a blazer of a little bit different type. This type of blazer is the so-called um, uh, high frequency peak uh, blazer. The 3C279 has a spectrum peaking in the far infrared. And so it's called, it's, it's known as a low frequency peak blazer. ES-1959 uh, is a high frequency peak laser. The, the synchrotron uh, spectrum peaks at, at X-rays, at soft X-rays, or hard X-rays during outbursts. It's a little bit closer. It's a more famous TV source. In fact, this is an old uh, uh, TV uh, source, exactly because it, it's, uh, it's closer. It's rather close by. It's been detected at TV uh, energies uh, uh, at many epochs. And here is just the, the, um, the flux on top of uh, two epochs, uh, two monitoring epochs in 2009, and the accompanying uh, polarization, which is seen to correlate in very different ways in the two occasions. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, um, more or less constant uh, as opposed to flux increase. And in the first epoch, while in the 2B epoch, the second epoch, it, there is a good correlation between flux and linear polarization. And this, of course, is uh, related to the different uh, uh, stochastic behavior of uh, jets. There is no uh, predictability of uh, uh, blazer jets uh, behavior. So, so it's, uh, it's to be expected that correlations may change with emission state, with epoch, with time. And the position angle is rather constant in this case. Um, this is a very uh, nice example of correlated, a correlated radio to X-ray, in fact, to TV energies uh, of uh, um, monitoring of BLAC. Uh, this is the prototype of the Blazer uh, class. It's a nearby uh, object, uh, which makes it a, a, an easier source to uh, observe, to detect the TV energies. This is a, a, a campaign that started, uh, was meant to be a multi wavelength campaign together with uh, a monitoring, radio monitoring of uh, radio knots, of the behavior, temporal behavior of uh, radio components in this source. So on top you see a map, uh, uh, um, uh, radio maps, time resolved radio maps that follow uh, the, the, you have the, the central source, which is uh, uh, indicated by the zero milliard seconds. That's the, uh, the nucleus, the location of the host galaxy of this uh, uh, blazer. And then you see the development with time of uh, radio comp different radio components. Uh, in the bottom, you see the results of a campaign, a multi wavelength campaign that uh, follow the behavior of this source during the same at simultaneous epochs, as you can see in the bottom, more or less the years, you follow the years, they develop between the, 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 the beginning of 2000, 2005 and the end of 2006. And uh, you see the, the light curve, X ray light curve, X ray spectral index, the optical uh, light curve, and the radio. And then a blow up the, the, the two. Um, uh, vertical uh, dashed lines, this, the stripe delimited by those two lines is blown up 
in, on the right. So you see, uh, you have a better view of the variability in these bands. There is a little arrow in the X-ray, uh, in the, the E panel, which is a blow up of the X-ray light curve that shows you the detection of photo, TV photons. And uh, in the, uh, uh, so you see again, the blow up of the optical in R band, and then the, the polarization behavior. So you see the you have the, the, the arrow in the H panel indicates the crossing of the, the, or the radio knot crossing of the core area, which you, you can map, you can associate with the second map on top. Uh, just before that epoch, the, the flare has developed the rotation, uh, the, the position angle of the polarization has undergone an almost complete cycle, almost, almost complete rotation. At the same time, the polarization percentage flares up and goes to a minimum and flares up again. This is a complex uh, behavior that was explained with a empirical uh, uh, heuristic model that you see on in the uh, in the right in the right panel indicates shows a, a, a jet where there is a helical uh, magnetic field and the plasma the, the departure of the knot from the center is accompanied by this uh, uh, by the flare at all other wavelengths so then then you see the knot appears becomes visible in radio and it triggers a second Flare, which you can see here in X-rays and R-band around epoch 2005, around the end of year 2005. So it, in this present case, particular case, the uh, availability of polarization information uh, guided the modeling of the, uh, of the behavior of the outburst of the development and uh, uh, the start and development of the outburst. This is a very nice observation. Um, here you see one of the um, one of the blazers that have the most extreme uh, synchrotron behaviors. As I was saying, uh, blazer synchrotron spectrum have, you, you see here the typical uh, spectral behavior of a blazer. The, 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 the component, a first component which is produced, the first hump that is produced by synchrotron radiation and the second hump that is inverse Compton of uh, uh, synchrotron photons, as in this case, in Marcaya 501, or other uh, external photon fields, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, like accretion disk or emission lines. The present, uh, the present case, this particular uh, blazer has a synchrotron component peaking at, uh, in the X-ray domain. So that's why it's called extreme. Well, th that's not exactly the reason. There are several, many blazers that have soft X-ray peaking synchrotron components. The maxima, maximum of the synchrotron component is between the ultraviolet, located between ultraviolet and soft X-rays. Well, in some cases, in a, a few in a subclass, uh, during outbursts, this synchrotron component flares up and the synchrotron maximum shifts to up to 100 kV or perhaps more. And that's why they are called extreme synchrotron blazers. Uh, so, the, of course, the, the, uh, the, the very high energy uh, synchrotron maximum are, um, of course, the node betray the presence of extremely energetic uh, electrons, and therefore the Klein-Nishina uh, domain, the Klein-Nishina effect, uh, suppresses the uh, TEV, the inverse Compton component, uh, very dramatically. So generally, the very high, the high energy component, the inverse Compton component in these blazers is has a lower luminosity than the synchrotron component because it is highly Kleinishina suppressed, as you can see here. Um, 
So these these are the, the, the three the, 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 the three spectra taken at different years. So 16 April 97 is when BepoSax, the BepoSax satellite, saw the uh, one of the biggest, the most spectacular uh, flares of this uh, uh, source, and then in su subsequent years the uh, synchrotron component uh, cooled down, and accordingly the synchrotron maximum shifted back to lower uh, energies. Uh, recently, the, so this source is known to be a polarized source. You see here the polarization uh, degree in optical in this uh, view graph. If you look at the, at the, at the four uh, left panels, you see a historical uh, uh, optical light curve in R band in the top, historical polarization, linear polarization degree in the bottom, and then the polarization angle and uh, the X-ray flux in the, the, the fourth bottom panel. The um, polar optical polarization is uh, uh, significant. It goes up to 6% uh, uh, or more. And uh, recently, this source has been selected for uh, observations with XPET. They recently launched the uh, X-ray uh, polarization satellite and uh, um, very interestingly, uh, XP detected a level of polarization that is higher both than both radio and optical. You see this uh, on the right, you see a, a, a polarized spectral energy distribution of this source. I mean, it is just this, the spectrum of the polarized radiation, which is on average uh, two, two percent in radio and optical. Uh, the, the, the triangles indicate the uh, subtracted, the host subtracted value of the polarization in optical and compared with the X-ray, the X-ray polarization is much, much higher. And this is, uh, this led the uh, authors, Liodakis et al, who, if I'm not mistaken, Liodakis may have uh, talked about this source and this observation precisely during one of these webinars, if I'm not mistaken. But the um, level of the polarization and the alignment of polarization angle and jet direction as derived by these radio maps of this source indicate uh, shock accelerated energy stratified electron population in this uh, uh, source. We now go to, uh, we move from blazers to gamma ray bursts, which are also uh, very interesting polarized uh, sources. This is one of the most interesting because uh, it is so distant. I think this is the farthest uh, gamma ray burst for which uh, polarization has been measured. And uh, you see here in the, in the top left, uh, you see a, a, a light curve. You see the X-ray and the optical light curves. Uh, with the typical afterglow, this is this is not the gamma ray burst. This is the after the X optical and X ray counterpart. The bright afterglow that is quick uh, decreasing. It's uh, the, at some point it starts decreasing faster than at the beginning. The so called break point, the the the, the temporal break of the afterglow light curve, which uh, is probably, possibly, physically related to the physical um, extent, to the physical um, geometry of the jet. Allegedly, the T-break, uh, the, the time at which the afterglow starts uh, fading uh, more quickly, is related, gives you uh, uh, a measurement, an estimate of the jet opening angle. Uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, allegedly some models, this is a model dependent statement, some models foresee a change of uh, uh, polarization position angle at that time when that geometrical uh, physical limit is reached. And apparently this is what is seen in polarization measurements of this uh, object. If you look at the bottom curves, 
the bottom temporal curves give, uh, show you in red, the red balls show you the um, polarization measurements, which uh, have been taken, they, they are separated by, they are taken at two different epochs. And uh, if you look at the position angle in the bottom, the um, prediction, the, the horizontal dashed lines indicate the model predictions. Uh, apparently, the uh, measurements are um, agree uh, very satisfactorily with this uh, uh, prediction of the position angle variation across uh, the temporal break, across uh, the uh, physical uh, size of the, of the jet. And the same, this, the, there is a comparison here, the, the data are compared with uh, the measurements of a closer uh, gamma ray, previous gamma ray burst, 18 October 2009, that are actually um, different. The, the polarization percentage is different, but the behavior of the position angle is uh, consistent. Um, quite interestingly, uh, I should say maybe curiously, because we don't really know what to make of it. Well, it's a very complex type of measurement. This uh, gamma ray burst, 24 October 2012, showed even some circular polarization uh, at low level, uh, but there is apparently a, 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 a measurement that is, can be seen as uh, significant of circular uh, polarization. It's the only case and uh, among gamma ray bursts, and it is anyway quite difficult, quite complex to interpret. So it would be nice, in fact, it would be interesting to be able to measure more circular polarization, let alone linear polarization of gamma ray bursts. And particularly, particularly if we could do that early enough at sufficiently early epochs after the explosion. Uh, this has been done, uh, as you can see here, in this uh, example of uh, uh, a TEV gamma ray burst. This is one of the very few gamma ray bursts detected so far at TEV energies. You see on the left, uh, uh, top left, you see the collection of the, of the multi-wavelength light curves from uh, TV, from radio to up to, you should be able to see here, yes, there is also the magic uh, points. So it's radio to TV likers. And on the right, you see the spectral energy distributions. Uh, the bottom shows in three bands, V, R, and I, the mm, polarimetric uh, measurements, uh, taken very, very early on, start, which started very early on, as you see, uh, 500 seconds after the, um, after the gamma ray burst, there is a detection in all bands with this uh, uh, telescope. This is a two meter telescope, plus uh, uh, at the polarimeter that used to be mounted on this telescope. It, it's been mounted till uh, recently, Ringo 3. Um, which unfortunately has only that, that couldn't could not follow the source uh, uh, later on. Anyway, this is uh, it's already very interesting to have this early detection. It's uh, just a pity that uh, there are not more. Uh, there is no more. And, but this is uh, at the level of a few uh, percent as uh, seen before, as in as in the previous. Uh, as in the previous cases that we've seen in the previous slide. So apparently gamma ray burst polarization does not reach as high values as in blazers, which tells a lot about the, the, the magnetic fields and the role of magnetic fields and geometry in these type, in these jets, blazer and gamma ray burst jets, which must be very different in their behavior clearly. This is a, 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 an interest, still an interesting uh, slide. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is no detection, but this is the first uh, measurement of X-ray polarization, again with x of course, um, for a gamma ray burst. And again, it's the bright one, uh, the brightest of all times is again the 9 October uh, 2000, 2022 gamma ray burst. 
uh, you see the beautiful uh, like uh, the prompt event like uh, on the left uh, that shows both uh, uh, in the, the, the prompt event and the early part of the of the afterglow in hard x-rays between 80 and 320 kV. The bottom shows uh, the swift uh, detection. Swift didn't detect this source immediately. This is the top is a, is a conus wind detection. There was a Fermi GBM detection and then uh, Swift uh, followed, but uh, Swift monitored the, the afterglow for a very long time, as you can see here, um, up to the 10 to the seven seconds, so, so several months after the explosion. On the right, you see the, the balls are not the detections. Those are estimates of the background. And you see the arrow, the three arrows indicate the three upper limits uh, obtained corresponding with these three different estimates of the background. Um, yeah, and the bottom, the bottom uh, plot is just uh, to, to put the, the, the source in context, just to show it, it, it is just a, a comparison of the uh, isotropic gamma ray energy of this source, just to give you an idea of the power of this source um, compared with a, a sizable uh, uh, sample of long gamma ray bursts with redshift. This is not all gamma ray bursts, long gamma ray bursts uh, with redshift that we know of. It's a good fraction of them. And uh, our guy, our 9 October guy is clearly a, a very big, a very big, uh, very, very strong source. Um, there was, as you know, long, virtually all long gamma ray bursts are associated with uh, supernovae, with core collapse, uh, uh, stripped envelope core collapse uh, supernovae, namely supernovae, the, the, uh, supernova explosions, uh, uh, explosions of stars that have lost completely their hydrogen and helium envelopes uh, before explosion. So they explode as type 1c supernovae, stripped envelope supernovae. They lack completely hydrogen and helium features in their ejecta. And one of the closest ones and best studied was this one at a relatively low redshift, obviously, in fact, quite, quite low redshift. It's very famous because the early uh, light curves, the early the X-ray and ultraviolet uh, um, early light curve of this source uh, indicated a, a component, uh, a very bright X-ray and UV component, uh, which has uh, debated uh, interpretation. It's not clear if it is a shock breakout of the supernova or non-thermal uh, jetted emission, it's not, uh, it is not uh, um, clear and not agreed upon. Certainly the supernova, the, the ensuing, ensuing supernova that you see here in the panel that says uh, UBOT, those are, U, those are optical and ultraviolet light curves obtained by UBOT of the counterpart starting one day, 10 to the five seconds after the explosion, the light curve is obviously dominated by the supernova. And on the right, you see the measurement of the polarization. There is polarization uh, uh, associated, with, associated with this supernova uh, at the level of a few uh, percent. In fact, uh, you should particularly look at the bottom uh, panel because that's corrected uh, polarization, corrected for the um, uh, contribution of host galaxy and afterglow. And it shows a highly variable polarization of the supernova with uh, time. So these are also uh, possible very uh, supernova type 1c core collapse supernovae have uh, potentially very highly asymmetric explosion. They can be very asymmetric sources because the, the, the exploding star is rotated, is a massive star with rotation. So rotation must, is expected to imprint some sort of directionality in the explosion, particularly if the supernova is associated with a gamma ray burst, 
where we know for sure that there, there is a preferential direction, which is the direction of the jet. So you do expect some high level of asymmetry in general in core collapse supernovae, and in particular in those associated with gamma ray bursts. So you expect to be able to measure some significant uh, pol polarization. And this is, the, this is what's left, right? After, after a core collapse uh, supernova, after many, many years. Um, this is uh, Cas A, one of the most famous uh, um, supernova remnants in the galaxy. It is particularly important because uh, uh, Cas A is uh, almost certainly um, the result of a core collapse uh, supernova. And uh, uh, you still see that is even the idea, even the, the, the trace of some directional structure that has been expelled, emitted by this source, there is this jet that you see in uh, optical and radio light, the bottom left image. Uh, so the bottom left image also has, uh, that's, a, that's a composite optical and radio image. And there, there are overlaid some small white lines that indicate the intensity of the polarization. There are many polarimetric maps done with this. These are actually, this is actually a millimetric uh, polarization. This is millime submillimetric polar uh, polarizations taken at uh, uh, SCUBA. And uh, they indicate a very interesting, very uh, uh, nice pattern that um, has been uh, interpreted as a tracer of dust formation and evolution. The same, the, the, the same source in X-rays you see you, is shown on top. That's the Chandra image in purple is the Chandra total light image of Casse. Um, sorry, in blue, you see the, the blue, the blue features is the, the, the X-ray total light. The purple one, which you see also as an intensity map on the right, is the polarization, is the X-ray polar, uh, polarized image of Casse as measured by XPET. Uh, that shows some very irregular, non-uniform pattern that give, give you uh, uh, an idea. They are interpreted as uh, um, being related to the um, shock compression and magnetic field compression along the rim of the, of the supernova remnant, a very complex uh, pattern, very interesting. And the polarization is also quite high. It's uh, the, the, between two and five percent in X rays and up to thirty percent in uh, radio in uh, submillimetric. Elena, sorry, yeah. you have five more minutes. Okay, so I will show now the uh, VST pole, which is the next uh, polarimetric uh, facility. At ESO, it's a camera, it's a large field of view camera for the VLT survey telescope. This is the, so you have various images here of the Paranal uh, summit with the four VLT units that you see here in various perspectives. And you see the, uh, also the VST telescope, the VLT survey, the 2.6 VLT survey telescope in these same images which has recently changed hands. It, it is now managed by uh, ENAF and no longer by ISO. So um, we are uh, building, so, so, so far VST has been around for a long time. And it has done a lot of survey work with Omega Cam, which is an optical total light uh, camera uh, with various filters. The idea is to um, equip now uh, to fit the VST with a polarimetric large field uh, camera and possibly to uh, uh, install also the rapid response mode to, to, to make the telescope semi-robotic, not semi-robotic, uh, this is improper, to allow the telescope to respond to alerts, to very fast alerts in a very rapid time, just like the VLT, so in a, in a time, in a, in a matter of minutes. Uh, 
So this uh, uh, new camera that we are uh, uh, planning is part, is, uh, is funded uh, uh, by the recovery, post-COVID recovery plan and uh, is, uh, the, is, is coordinated, the, the design and implement, implementation is led by INAF, by the observatories of Brera and uh, Naples in particular. As you can see here from the central graph, uh, the, the, the transmission uh, of, the, of the camera peaks in the V to R band. And so will the polarimetry will be maximum, the, the maximum sensitivity for polarimetry will be in that band. Uh, it, the camera is good, has a good transmission also in I band, but then the polarimetric capability, the polarimetric uh, performance is decreasing quite uh, rapidly in that band. So the purpose of uh, VST poll will be to enhance the uh, polarimetric capabilities at uh, ISO and to operate, to, co to, to, um, to coordinate with multi-wavelength campaigns of transients, in particular uh, CTA, in particular uh, TV transients, uh, which will be the, the prime targets of uh, CTA, and possibly, uh, since it is a large camera, it can be coordinated, it can, be, uh, uh, can work together with uh, other large field instruments like uh, Rubin or uh, radio arrays in the future, like the Mercat, uh, SKA. Mm. It is, it, I have already illustrated a, a number of scientific cases where uh, having a sensitive polarimetric facility may make a big difference. I would like to add uh, the, the multi-messenger aspect of this activity. As you know, later in the spring, uh, the uh, LIGO-Virgo interferometers will resume operations. Occasionally, the error box of the gravitational sources will be some tens of degrees, which can be covered by a camera like VST pole, polarimetric camera like VST pole in a rather quick, can be tiled in a covered in a rather quick uh, time, and uh, um, in search for polarization of gravitational emitters, and in particular of these uh, uh, kilonome, these uh, uh, binary aftermaths of uh, binary neutron star uh, mergers. The only one that we know so far has a low polarization, 0.5%. However, the uh, view in a, the polarization of these uh, uh, neutron star mergers can be uh, very angle, very highly angle dependent. So we may measure variable, possibly higher polarization, maybe, vari maybe variable with time, depending in a, if we were located in a more favorable uh, viewing angle. And uh, so these are my conclusions that I will leave uh, here since I think my time is over and um, I will take questions. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>